Um, let's see. Okay. So yeah, welcome to Dome Talk, and uh, I'm Aaron, and I'll be moderating this and uh, trying to post pictures and links while while we're going. Uh, we try to focus on the questions that came in before the meeting, and um, you know the the chat's always open, so we'll try to also get things. And if you have questions that pertain to what we're doing at the time, then please put them in there, and we'll we'll try to answer those as we go. Um, and we try to stick to one hour, but we've actually got a pretty pretty big group tonight. So um, with that, we'll probably end up going a little bit late. But uh, yeah, if you want to bow out early, of course you can. But uh, yeah, feel free to stick around for the whole thing. Um, I guess for those of you who haven't been here before, I'll start with a short intro on who we are. Um, Natural Spaces Domes is owned and operated by Dennis Johnson and Tessa Hill, located in North Branch, Minnesota, we have a dome complex consisting of an office dome, three model dome homes, a screen porch dome, two workshop domes, and a mini dome, uh, which is our option for a small living space, kind of like a tiny house. Um, and as always, we invite you to come visit us for in-person tours. Um, Natural Spaces domes are special because they're designed to be easy to build, beautiful, healthy, energy efficient, living spaces while providing you the best housing value around. Our staff consists of 13 people with Dennis, Tessa, and Derek Miller leading the organization. Uh, Dennis is the dome guru. He has decades of experience as a designer, contractor, builder, and having designed over 1,200 domes worldwide, he knows what works and what doesn't. His patented dome connector system is the best available, and he sees to it that someone is there to help you with every step of your dome dream. Uh, Dennis and Tessa, can you say hi? Hi there, guys. Hello there. Welcome to our dome. Yeah, on this nice uh, summer evening here. Yeah, yeah it, and it is a hot one. And we'll discuss that in a minute, too. There's stuff about the temperature here. It's pretty warm. Um, and then next, we have our project manager, Derek Miller. Uh, he joined the team a few years ago, bringing with him a lifetime of construction experience. He handles a wide variety of responsibilities from collaborating with Dennis on project management, mm -hmm. client contact, and working in the shops to uh, refine building techniques. Um, he's deeply, deeply familiar with the dome construction process from the ground up, and he's also the video guy. So if you see any uh, like, uh, instructional videos and like the uh virtual dome school that that's his work so uh, he does a good job at that too so hi everybody cool um and with that i guess we'll uh get started here with the first question um we're first going to uh oh that's right the yeah. intro part <laughs> yeah that's right my mistake uh, we switched up for this evening here a little bit um we have across the nation, probably for one of the first times, it's uh, 90 and above, I think, from coast to coast and, and almost all the way to the North Country. I think it is 90 up there along the Canadian border mm -hmm. and over that. Um, we did a test here with a temperature probe that we have in the wall up, uh, I don't know, it's about three rows up um, um, inside of the wall cavity. So here you see the reading that we have. The walls we have in this dome are 18 inch thick. It's a ventilated dome built in 2005 and six, uh, completed in 2007. We have uh, a ventilated airspace between the insulation and the exterior panel. And that's where one of the probes was today. The outside temperature here was 94 degrees. The sun was out, it was shining on this wall, a roof, if you want to say that. The shingles that we have are not the um, highly reflective shingles. They're a standard, ordinary, medium color shingle. So the temperature in the airspace is what you're reading on that first probe. 
It's a two inch airspace. It's 155 and a half degrees. The next reading is the middle of 16 inches of insulation. So uh, the way I view that is if uh, technically, if you only had eight inches of insulation, the temperature would be 115 degrees. But with 16 inches of insulation, that temperature on the inside face of the insulation is 82 degrees. In com now, that's with the outside temperature, and that's what's shining down on that, on that roof structure. So the inside temperature, if you want to go to the next uh, picture, is the thermostat on the upper floor of our dome. So that is reading 77 degrees, five feet off of the upper floor. Um, in relation to that, on the main floor of our dome, the temperature reading on that thermostat ther thermometer was 73 degrees. At this point, and this was 2 p.m. in the afternoon, um, daylight saving time, um, at that point, we had one mini split air conditioning unit on in the master bedroom. That was set at 73 degrees. So on the main floor, it was 73 degrees. On the upper floor, it was 77 degrees. But outside, it was 94 degrees. You want to uh, switch to, uh, I don't know what, <laughs> what we're going to switch to on, the, on another photo, but. Um, One thing I'll mention too, Dennis, is you do have your second mini split um, up above the second floor a little bit. So if that one were running, it would kind of maintain more of an even temperature throughout the, the upper and lower floors probably because you'd have that cool air dropping down and that might help a little bit on the upper floor. Yeah, the, the mini split in the master bedroom, um, which is actually through an opening over here. This is the door to the master bedroom. It's a wide opening. It's 54 degrees and you can just barely make that out in there or the edge of it. Um, it's a 9,000 BTU unit. That's all it is. And that's what's been cooling the house all day long until about four o'clock when Tessa tuned in, turned on the upper mini split system, which is an 18,000 BTU unit. Um, I didn't check the upper floor thermostat, but it's probably down to this normal level that we would have 74, 75 degrees. We really uh, are anticipating a warmer day tomorrow. So we're trying to keep the house in cool condition. I don't think it's gonna drop, uh, what's the nice temperature, do you know? It's gonna be 70 or something. It was about, it's a, gonna be about that. There's worse places in the, in the US here. Um, but it's the situation of as much insulation as we have. Uh, that is going to help you. Now, we are in a pine tree forest. So we don't have a sunset or a sunrise because we've got between 50 to 70 foot high pine trees. It is open on the south side. Uh, in back of me is what you're seeing is the south side. These windows faced east, southeast, all these skylight windows. So we've got a site orientation that we're concerned about. We didn't want all of these skylights facing due south. The view that we have is down through these lower windows. So uh, that's all part of the orientation. If you got a wind, if you have a site where all the windows and skylights are going to face west and south, then we've got some issues. But the issues are. Uh, as we're going to talk about later with some of the questions, putting in the right glass, tinted glass. These are triple pane windows, and there's a low E coating on them. So we'll get into that later in one of the uh, discussions relating to uh, glass and skylights and sun. 
So I don't know um, where it is where all of you all are. We've got people all over the country here, um, but it's uh, it's above 90 or 100 or maybe above 110 if you're in Phoenix uh, again, you know. Yeah, we got yeah. Uh, Peter's at 115 in Mesa, he said. So I remember oh, those days. Okay. I lived in Phoenix for over 20 years. So yeah, sure. I definitely remember the 115 or hotter days. So oh yeah well and it, you kind of think that dry heat's overrated when it's 115 it's like yeah it doesn't really matter if it's dry heat or not at that point <laughs> yeah so we can start into with, with our questions i guess sure okay uh let's see the first question is from melissa in madison wisconsin uh, i would like to build a mini dome but want to include rain catchment into my water system is there a way to catch rain off of a dome structure and is there a safe material that can be used for the exterior for that purpose? Um, also, uh, she has a question about using um, gray water for nearby gardens. And is there a way to include that into the plan so a builder that doesn't know gray water very well can follow that? Um, and is there any difficulty in uh, using a composting toilet in the mini dome? So that question goes to me because we built a dome in 1975 that had a Clivus Multrum composting toilet. Uh, it's still there, still operational. Um, we also had a gray water handling system with two large tanks, two, um, I don't know if it was about 50 gallon special fiberglass tanks for handling the gray water. Uh, gray water being the, the sinks and uh, the shower, um, those are that's the gray water. So the Clivus Maltrum is a large unit. The composting toilets these days you can get very small units that fit uh, into it. Um, that's the the one in the middle and on the right uh, are similar in size to what the Clivus Maltrum is. The one on the left is and those in front of you are portable ones basically. They're self-contained on the floor. They uh, either have a little step um, to step up onto it. Uh, some of them like the one on the right. One on the right, that tank is, is supposed to be down below the floor level. So there's a variety of things that, that can be done with that. The gray water handling system was a problem um, because the, the kitchen sinks went into there and there was a lot of food particles that went down into it and sort of clogged it up um, after a while. Uh, and it really didn't work well and it wasn't designed well. And it was in the crawl space, it was hard to get to. So uh, I don't know how many years later we sort of abandoned that. And we had a small septic tank outside that we used for many years until we did some additions where we added a bigger septic field. We do have a customer who um, specializes in this. He used to work for the Minnesota Pollution Control Association, uh, which is down in Red Wing, Minnesota. He has a um, system that does not use a septic field. It's a peat field. And with that, he has a drainage system for the gray water that goes into this marsh area, pond area as a beginning cleansing to the, uh, to the gray water. And then that flows into this peaked field. So if you're really looking to handle that gray water or if you wanna put it in uh, the garden, uh, it can be done. Minnesota, when we had them change the rules early on, it was a system that um, was approved by the state. Whether it is or not in your county, you'll have to look at that. Um, the first part of this question that related to um, the water catchment situation, you want to capture the water. We have gutters on, uh, on this Bear Creek Dome. We have gutters on the office dome and the, we call the forest dome. Uh, and even the other dome, the guest dome that we have. And there's a picture there if you want to show that 
of the gutters, the standard gutters uh, yeah. on the, um, yeah, if you can find yeah, the one I, I think. This. So it's just a standard gutter. Now, the ones here at Bear Creek, we did a little customization of it at the bottom of the triangles. It's a square sheet metal made gutter that we did. So it just looked architecturally better. But a gutter is put at the base of the shingles and it's gonna catch whatever rain comes off of the dome. Uh, if it's wind-driven rain, you're not gonna see, uh, see that. The part of that question was, um, is there a safe material that can be used for the roof? Because if you're gonna use water off of an asphalt shingled roof, and there you go with, uh, with this gutter system that we have, this one was taken, I just took one earlier, but the one that, that he's got up on screen is in the fall. Um, we can get to the leaves. They're you know six feet off the ground. They're not 12 feet up. Uh, the ones on the left are in front of the lower windows and they're right there at uh, knee level. So you can get to your gutters, you can clean them out. The one on the right, you see the downspout going along at the edge of it. And if the if the pictures were reversed, that's okay, um, Aaron. But the one on the on the right, the gutters on the right hand side, and on the left picture, you see that gutter coming down. And then we have a four inch diameter drain tile. Well, it's a drain tube that takes it over the hill because uh, we had some erosion at one point and we wanted to get the water away from this the base of the dome it's like any other house put your gutters on then you need those eight foot extenders to get the water away from um, the base of the house you don't want water at that point so it is very easy to do uh, you can fit them in you can custom make them or you can use standard conventional structures we don't have any leaf guards, if I want to use that trade name. Uh, and we just come and clean it out or blow it out with the air compressor. Did you uh, talk about any safe materials for roofing, Dennis? I might have missed that. Oh, yeah, you missed that. <laughs> the safer material would be um, the metal roofing system that we use, which is the Ranky Shakes. They're an aluminum shake with a Kynar finish on it in color. So you can get copper colored. There's, I think, eight, seven or eight different colors you could choose from. Substantially less uh, pollutants. There's one that's all shingled all the way to the ground in the Roman gold color. Those aren't copper, those are Roman gold. You can get the copper if you want to cash in your 401. Um, you can put copper shingles on it. And I kid that. Then you have to put that fence up around to protect with the barbed wire on top. And so people will come and steal your shingles off your roof. But the aluminum shakes are going to be substantially less polluting from the standpoint of the material. Instead of asphalt shingles, which are an oil-based asphalt product, which you would get into that water. How much concern you would have in dealing with the water, using it for garden, uh, I'm not sure. Because if you didn't collect that water off of your asphalt shingled roof, it would go down into the ground around your house, into the garden area around your house. I don't know of any studies that have been done showing how much pollution there is or not. But one thing Cynthia in the chat was asking is if we had a picture with showing of the last American roofing, I don't know if you got a mini dome, easy to access, uh, Aaron, but that would be a picture with a mini dome of a last American roof. Uh, uh, let me see. I think I have one. The last mini dome then. We had some problems early on with the last American. You've got to find the right coating. It's got to be a high grade um, acrylic type coating because the early ones that we were using in the 70s, um, this is the one out in Taos, New Mexico, um, and that's the newer kind of coating that's on, you're still gonna get dust, you know, that's gonna accumulate and the rain is gonna wash it off. But uh, 
there was streaking uh, from some of the early coatings. Uh, there's some brand names that we used and we switched and found the proper coatings that were uh, totally sealable from that standpoint. All right. Okay. Um, let's see. So I think that covers all of Melissa's questions. Uh, yes. And now we have uh, is it G. Somebody's got a question. Okay. Somebody have a question. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify. So when you talked about the elastomeric, is that also something you could use with rain catchment to for doing potable water? Um, I don't know if you could have potable water for drinking. Well, it's a hard I mean, one when you're you... always going to filter it. There's, I understand that, but yeah, okay. Again, comparable to the metal is my question. Um, yeah, I would say it would be if you found the right um, brand. GAF bought uh, the company we were using, and they have a material called Roofmate. And that's available actually through uh, through GAF through Home Depot. Um, you will have to recoat that elastomeric coating uh, somewhere between five to seven years, and it does take somewhere in the range of eight to ten coats in putting that on. It is really should only be used in a dry climate zone. We've tried it in the wet climate zones from Minnesota, northern Minnesota to Helsinki, uh, Finland. And uh, it, uh, it doesn't do well with snow and ice buildup. Um, plus, in putting it on, you need two to three days between each coat for to allow it to thoroughly dry. And that's the big hang up, trying to use that in a wet climate zone to get your eight to 10 coats on there. You want a 40 mil thickness is what you want. Other than that, as far as the water off of it, yeah, it's whatever is in the air, whatever pollution you have around your site, uh, whether that's, uh, who knows, <laughs> with all the industrial plants, where are you living and how pure is your air from that standpoint? Okay. All right. Um, and I see some questions in here about fireproofing. I think we have a question that's going to come up on that. So um, we'll we'll get to that one when uh, we get yep. to that question, Michael. Sure. Uh, okay. So next one here. Um, so this is from is it G Trov in in uh, New Hampshire. It says we have a dome in New Hampshire that's due for a re-roof before the winter, and we want to do it right. We have an air exchanger that does a pretty good job of removing most of the moisture and we know it works over time in the winter especially when we're covered in snow is replacing the top pentagon with a cupola truly our only option if so how do we retrofit our dome to be able to allow airflow under the plywood to release the pressure upwards does it require a full rebuild to create that air gap uh, Derek? Yeah, well, that one, yeah, so if you're trying to ventilate a dome that was not originally built for ventilation, that is quite the job because you do have to create then an airspace in between the insulation, the roof decking to create the ventilated air, I guess, to go and vents on the bottom, vents on the top. Um, it is not necessarily have a ventilated dome depending on new hampshire still not depends on your r value there's a lot of factors in there um but you do not have to put a cupola on top if you were concerned about it you could just put a little vent cap any kind of ventilation on top does not have to be a cupola necessarily we call it a vent cupola maybe that's what you're referring to versus a view cupola like what dennis has at bear creek um but basically what you're going to do is you're going to want some way to exhaust that air through the top if your dome performs fairly well, but you do get a little build up in the upper Pentagon, you can also do vapor diffusion ports, um, which is a way where you don't have to create an entire ventilated system, but you can essentially, um, and this was discovered a lot with like SIP buildings where a lot of the moisture would gather up to the very peak, and then they would have um, 
an opening in the dome that would be vapor open but air sealed so it prevents air drafting from going in and out but allows the vapor to escape through the top because vapor is going to want to collect um, at the warmest peak of your structure so it's just a way on the top pentagon to be able to allow that moisture to escape without doing as thorough of a rebuild and that might be all you need um, but yeah you do not need a like a view cupola you could do a vent cupola cap which is just essentially just a little over roof that allows you to have a hole underneath for the air to escape without critters and stuff getting in there. So um, I don't know if that is exactly what you're asking. And we always encourage people to jump in when we're answering their questions if, if we miss what they're looking for. But unless you're having major condensation problems, um, you don't necessarily have to worry about a ventilated dome system. Uh, in fact, the latest, greatest building science right now is starting to get away from ventilated roofs. Um, there's been a lot of studies now on hot roofs that show it's not that much of a temperature difference on the roof itself versus a ventilated roof. Um, vapor mitigation and uh, errors in building construction really can be helped out by a ventilated system because if you miss certain spots and a little bit of moisture does get in your dome shell, it just makes that much easier for it to, to uh, dry out. Um, but if it's built correctly and stuff, you do not need to have a ventilated dome system. Um, and if you had a non-ventilated dome system, those vapor diffusion parts would be the uh, easiest, lowest cost solution just to get some of that moisture maybe trapped in the top Pentagon to be able to escape um, without retrofitting your dome for a complete um, ventilated system because you'd have to access the struts and put notches in them you'd have to make sure every triangle can breathe to the next triangle as it works its way up so it's a pretty intensive process to do um so yeah that might be more of a phone call because that could be a pretty more in-depth um conversation to get more details i guess on that one so but hopefully that answered it good enough to kind of let you know that you do not have to put a cupola up there at least not a view cupola type of a of a solution um, you just need to get some kind of ventilation up on top. And then, you know, we do make a vent cupola cap, we call it, but you could even just do more basic vents like you'd find on a conventional house and still, you know, give you the same performance. Usually just doesn't look as nice, but those would be your options. Hopefully that got it for you. Yeah, hopefully. I'm not, I'm not sure if, uh, if, if they're in the, the room or not, but, um, Either way, good information for everyone else. So, sure, sure. Cool. Um, okay, so moving on to the next one, we actually have a few people that have sort of similar questions. Um, is it, it was Fran in Maryland? Uh, I think it was Fernando in Ohio, um, and uh, Lynn in Virginia. Um, just kind of want to know how to get started building a dome, um, like how 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 the process sort of um, initiates. Um, I, I do want to point out that, um, let's see, I think it's in the, well, one of the basic places to, to start is the learning center on our website. Um, there's a lot of good information there, um, kind of how to, about our dome system, how much does it cost? There's a calculator there and, and some basic steps on how you go about ordering it and deciding on your, um, like, you know, floor plans and things like that. But, um, that said, I'll open the floor to uh, Derek and Dennis to uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, it really uh, is a matter of looking through our website first. And it's a, it's a large, very detailed website. Most of your questions can be answered there. Uh, there are some, a page called Frequently Asked Questions. Uh, within that, there are links to the YouTube pages that we have with answers to the questions and with previous recordings that we have um, that we took video off and listed them for categories from the Zoom talks that we have done. There's whole entire Zoom talks that are listed on there also. You can take listening to a whole long another Zoom talk where you're not uh, answering answering your exact question. But it really relates to um, another issue that we have. And we want to say that basically, if, if you are starting out 
right now to learn about domes and uh, you're talking about uh, finding a plan or discussing custom plans, discussing changes to plans. Um, you're dealing with us in for 2024. We basically, with the clients that we currently have in place right now, are booked up through 2023. A few of those clients are going to build in 2024. We've even started somewhat of a little bit list for 2024. To try to start now and build now, even if you are in a warm climate zone, uh, if you want totally custom plans, it's going to be several months. And the customers that we have right now, we have quite a few, and we're uh, trying to handle all those and get those through building permits. And that's eating up all of our time from the drawing standpoint, uh, from the planning standpoint. So I got to say that. But to start now is not too early to plan for spring and summer of 2024. Uh, I know we've even got one client that's in 2025, <laughs> but it's because they're not ready. Um, so, um, the parts and pieces to the dome, you can understand and look at. We actually have a virtual dome school that can teach you a lot. And that's $195. And it's 11, 10, 11, maybe even 12 hours long in sections. So you can read through that, listen through that, uh, stop whatever you want and, uh, and catch up wherever you want or go to the sections that you want to hear about or read about. So that will give you a real heads up on what it takes to build a dome and how it goes together and all those components. We basically filmed a dome during the pandemic that we were putting up and created a virtual dome school. The next dome school that we have is the second weekend in June of 2024. And then we have another one scheduled for the same kind of second week in 2025. So that can be signed up for on our website. The $195 fee for the virtual dome school is like a lot of our training stuff, uh, refundable or credited when you buy a dome from us. So it goes against the cost of your dome or it deducts from the cost of your dome. Okay. I think that answers somewhat all of it and the rest of it can be found on our website i think you jumped on a few there um let's say how does one initiate consulting contract with you to perform dome design for layout i guess you kind of got that one too i think we got a few questions there yeah yeah okay. yeah the, the consulting one is really uh set that up we're probably uh three to four weeks out um with scheduling consultations with the workload and vacations that we have set up. I mentioned that, so mm -hmm. all part of the small business when you're dealing with uh, a people load that uh, is trying to handle a lot of things. And that's also one of the reasons why Dome Talk was started as well is because yeah, right. people do have a lot of questions and, and getting a uh, one-on-one -on -one situation just takes up a lot of time, but you can also all join as a group and have whatever you know questions you like to ask. So it works out great. Yeah, good. Um, okay, so let's go down to uh, let's see. Uh, Caitlin Horowitz from Lakewood, Colorado, uh, wants to discuss the tie-down hardware and bolts that uh, go to the foundation. Uh, what's the process? look like after the concrete is poured and how you attach the riser walls. Is Katie with us? I don't have the list here next to me. Let's see if she is. I don't see her in the list, at least by name. I don't know if she's on a different really? name today. Um, Katie's building one of our domes at uh, 9,500 feet in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. And um, she's involved right now with uh, getting uh, bids and hiring contractors. 
We have her dome basically built, I believe, almost all the components. Um, she's got a building permit that's uh, not holding her up. Um, so the connections to the foundation depend on what kind of foundation you're building. We have domes going up right now with pure foundations, slab on grade, crawl space. Um, it just, it doesn't, a basement, a full basement. So it uh, just depends on that kind of foundation. We've got uh, a couple of brackets here that we're dealing with. This is a Simpson product. It's a hold down bracket. One of the things that we can provide you is you can go online and find, this is Simpson, it's called Simpson Strong Tie. That's the name of the company. And with this, you can find any kind of metal connection bracketing. And this is one of their products. This is an HDU2. And this is a little bit bigger one. It's an HDU5. So you see the difference in this hold down bracket. I think we've got a um, picture of this that Derek uh, sent to Aaron. So this is the bracket. This is actually a different bracket that I showed you. So this is called an HTT4. So we sell these, we provide these. That bolt that you see with that spiral thread is actually going down into the concrete. So after you have the riser wall up, which is the riser wall is on your, your left, and it's got a bracket on the bottom, it has one of these HDU connectors, you drill a hole into the concrete. You have to position this bracket. So we don't want you to put any anchor bolts coming up out of the concrete. You will be spending days probably <laughs> trying to get your riser wall set and accurately placed. So eliminate the anchor bolts coming up and use, this is the Titan bolt by um, Simpson. And it's a threaded bolt that screws into the concrete and provides the same uplift factor as an anchor bolt would. The other option to this is a threaded rod um, which goes down into the hole that you drill. And then a two-part epoxy adhesive uh, actually is first put into the hole. And then you put the threaded rod down into it and it sticks up through a, the bottom part of that HDU. And then there's a nut that goes on that and you tighten that nut after two days, uh, two, three days. Uh, I actually put one of these bolts in with its two-part epoxy into the rock at our cabin, the granite rock at our cabin in northern Minnesota. And uh, literally, it was two days later, it had cured, and uh, we tie off our pontoon boat uh, to that. It's, as <laughs> it's a pun intended, rock solid. It's just the same part as the rock. So. Um, this is what we provide. We sell that to you. So it's coming with the kit. You can buy these in special order them. Uh, they're not normally stocked, the HTT4 and the HTU2 and 4, but uh, it's something that we do stock and we can provide that with the kit so you get the right quantity. It's indicated on your plans when your plans are drawn where these are supposed to go. So um, we try to find products that are hard to find or custom ordered and stock those items. Uh, the ordinary uh, hangers and connections and joist hangers, uh, normally you're gonna find that at your Lowe's, Home Depot's, Menards, um, lumber yard, 84 lumber, wherever you may be in whatever big lumber yard box stores or you have around you. Okay, let's move on. Excellent. Oh, thanks, Katie, wherever you are. Um, let's see. Next one is from Tom in Maryland. Um, I'm trying to skip around here in this question real quick. So 
For those of us who haven't chosen a lot yet, are there special considerations when choosing one for building a dome house? And are some local governments resistant to folks building a dome house? Um, real quick, I think I just wanna say categorically no, those are not problems, um, but uh, I'll see if Derek has anything to add on that. Um, but also, um, they saw in regards to uh, ventilation where air is drawn from lower windows and exits through the cupola, um, as we experience more and more smoke from wildfires, what other options are there for ventilation that doesn't draw in outside air? Okay, so real quick, I'll just say this is now referring, we talked earlier about ventilating the dome shell. Um, this is gonna be ventilating the air within the dome itself. So air within the house that you're gonna be breathing. Um, and smoke is a hard one to filter. So air to air exchangers are a great device designed to provide fresh air, um, no matter if it's cold or hot, it, it can filter out pollen, it filters out a lot of stuff. Smoke is a tough one to filter out just due to the tiny particulate size. Um, so when it's bad, like it has been with these Canadian fires lately, um, probably the best thing to do, because the air to air exchanger will give you a good mechanical filter, but it won't do a whole lot for the smoke. So you'd probably be better off keeping your house sealed up for the most part when it's real bad and running an air purifier from within the house. And some of the good air purifiers can um, get rid of the smoke uh, that's in the air in your house. It's really tough to bring in smoky air and filter it properly before it enters your home. Um, at least with what you're gonna find for your basic air to air exchangers and the basic filtration media that's available for that. You could probably beef up your filtration media for your incoming air and filter a lot of that out. Um, but it's probably just a lot easier to get like an air purifier from within the house that filters smoke. Um, you can go several days with the air that's in your house, um, depending on how many, um, how much pollution you're making in the house. You know, if you're, if you're cooking burgers on the grill, for instance, or on the stovetop on, in your house, or doing a lot of baking, or, or like I do sometimes burning cheese on your pizza, and then you might be adding a lot of a lot of contamination to the inside air. But in other words, you're you're fine with the air if it's real bad for a couple of days. Close up your house, just have an air purifier, and then when it's it light lightens up a little bit, try to get some fresh air. And if that's an option for you, um, and yeah, Aaron, you're right. I won't really add any more to the second and third part of that question. You can build a dome anywhere a regular house is built, um, and the government has no problem with domes at all. Um, so yeah, no problems on either one of those, but. And like always, like I said earlier too, uh, this was for Tom. If you, if I didn't answer your question or you got more to add, feel free to jump in. Um, but hopefully that answers it as far as uh, what to do regarding the smoke. Smoke's just a tough one. Hard to get good air quality when it's got a lot of smoke in it. So there, there's a, a um, someone in chat saying that uh, Kansas City, Missouri is putting up fights on tiny homes. Um, do you have any, I guess, perspective on a dome versus a tiny home and if you know, there's anything to say there. Um, as far as for these, as, as far as for this, as far as for the city approving them getting built. Oh, sorry, I'm kind of looking at the chat too as you said that, and I saw a bunch of stuff in there. So, um, yeah, no, the tiny house thing is a tough one because certain, certain jurisdictions do limit like square footage. In fact, the county um, just south of here, I want to say is maybe 1200 square feet as a minimum. I don't know if you know Dennis offhand, um, but yeah, there are some government restrictions on square footage of house, not type of house necessarily with a dome. And some governments have no problem with the size, but you are right. That is sometimes the government restriction is, has to be X amount of square footage, mostly because the government wants a taxable house uh, to contribute towards the school system, the different things they want that tax money for. Um, but you know, you, you I think it's going to start to be more encouraged as energy and uh, climate change and things become a bigger problem. You know, smaller homes require fewer materials and fewer energy or less energy to to uh, you know keep them warm and cool and different things like that. So I think those codes will start to less, lessen up. But you are right; there are certain areas that do require certain square footage, in which case the mini dome may or may not qualify depending on your area and what their limit is. Okay. Uh, thanks, Tom, for the question. Um, let's see. Next up, we have a uh, CND Young from Nashville, Tennessee. 
Um, how would one of these dome homes be expected to hold up against a tornado or a large falling tree? So that, that is one of the areas where domes really shine. Um, due to their structure in general, the shape of them, they really handle snow loads, wind loads, and even tree loads <laughs> exceptionally well. So um, I just went up to a house in Northern Minnesota and this lady, sweetest lady, she built a dome in the 80s and she had 11 trees fall on her dome. Now these weren't all huge massive trees, but she had 11 trees fall on her dome. And uh, Dennis was talking about the minimal damage she received. Um, they do phenomenally. We had a picture, we couldn't find it, where there's a large tree that fell on a dome, very large tree, probably would have caved in a conventional house. I um, mean, it did do some damage to the dome, but very little by comparison. Um, and of course, Dennis, any of you that have been on here, be, oh, there it is. There it is. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> Good. Um, and anybody that has been on some of these dome talks, if I heard Dennis talk about uh, the beach dome one when a hurricane hit and moved it, and they were trying to destroy it with you know the large caterpillar equipment and stuff, and had a heck of a time. So domes are exceptionally strong for all those loads. Um, we, in fact, the New York Times just did an article on climate change and housing that's adapted to climate change. And they happen to feature one of our customers who's done went through a hurricane in Louisiana. Um, we also, I just uh, helped a, a gentleman in Iowa uh, build a, a 49 foot diameter dome just a few years ago now, and it was barely done and the derecho hit and I can't remember what the straight line winds were, Dennis. I don't know if you remember the miles per hour, but his one neighbor was so grateful he built that dome because the dome was in between him and the derecho. And he credited the dome for saving his house as a lot of the neighbors uh, did not fare very well in that situation. So, so yeah, they, they do great. They do great. Um, that's really where they shine. Snow load, wind load, hurricanes, tornadoes. Uh, there's Joel Joel's uh, dome in Louisiana went through a hurricane, there it is with the flooded water. You can see it did some shingle damage, but the dome itself is 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 good. So, um, so yeah, yeah, there's, oh, there's a beach dome one. So yeah, location. <laughs> there's there's <laughs> the beach dome. out of the road, so. Yep, it's uh, half in the neighbor's property across the street. Uh, there's the pilings that were in the front. You can see the words that say original beach dome pilings. That's where the dome was. And it lifted it up, moved it intact, floated it across, and uh, a lot of issues with uh, the city that we had because we wanted to just pick it up and put it back. And anyway, there's longer stories. A lot of these stories are on our website that say storm stories. So that's a that's a really good though indication that here's here's this dome that was just floated across. Um, we have a lot of customers where like the one that he had up earlier with the tree falling on it. And I'll say this, we had, um, he, he damaged or broke uh, five or six struts and several panels, four or five panels because of that tree falling down there and the limbs just broke right through and broke the strut. The dome didn't collapse. It just broke those pieces and he threw a tarp over it and we, made those particular struts for his 29 foot diameter dome and those panels, shipped them down to him. He took the old material out. We have a connection hardware system that bolts together, pins together, and he simply replaced them with other parts that we had shipped down and then shingled over that and you're back in business. The dome with all the trees on that Derek was mentioning, the repair on that, and this is the insurance company and a, and a contractor going around saying, we don't know how to estimate how much damage you're gonna have on your dome. We went up there and the repair work that we had was somewhere between an hour and a half to two hours. That was it. Seven shingles had to be replaced. We slipped the new ones in. Um, there was a dent on one of the uh, metal pieces on the edge of our skylight wasn't worth replacing. Nothing else was wrong. That was it. The wind didn't do anything. 
and the tree she couldn't go out of the main door because there were so many trees on her house. Big there were some big trees out there too. So um let's move on to the next yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. This one. Um I guess you can I, I guess I'll date myself. It's that old uh, ad that said uh a our natural spaces dome. Uh, I, I'm losing the, the thing, keeps on ticking. You know, it's the John Cameron Swayze commercial in the 50s that had a wristwatch that kept, took a licking and kept on, Keep kept on, on ticking. ticking. That's the word I want to say. And that's what the dome is going to do. That's what our dome is going to do. Okay, so we got here, I think this is uh, Michael from uh, San Jose. Um, is, he says, I have a property in uh, Central California, the uh, Almaden Valley, just south of San Jose. It's on a hillside and what's known as the uh, SRA, State Responsibility Area, which has stricter fire codes and uh, that the, he has to deal with. And it can be quite onerous constraints on the property. Um, so his primary interest is building a home of non-combustible materials that may allow for some relaxing of the codes. Um, can you make it out of a steel frame, triangles from non-combustible materials, while maintaining the cooling and heating advantages of the homes? The second biggest thing, of course, for California is earthquake threat. How do they withstand earthquakes? So we've had several domes go through earthquakes in the earthquake country with absolutely no damage. The dome is a structure that is held together by itself the foundation is what you have to design for. And the dome in Malibu was designed. Uh, I can go on and on about our structural engineer who we've been dealing with since 1985. Paul uh, lives in Los Angeles and works out of Los Angeles area. And this earthquake situation is understood by him very, very well. So the type of foundation that you do in an earthquake zone is really customized to the dome. It involves a lot of concrete underneath and the ability to allow the structure to move with the earth. And the dome is perfect because it's one structure. And it's not gonna take the walls and do this. That doesn't happen. You have a triangle, triangles don't move. They move together, they're all tied together. So nothing's going to rotate or collapse. The dome is intact. If you had a complete ball, it would roll down the hill or roll across the field. From the standpoint of the other part of that question, we have a bunch of photos that we'll show you. This is a prototype um, dome system, or not system, well, it's a system that we created. This is north of San Diego. This whole entire hillside had um, our fire go through the customer in the center of your screen. There's four domes there. He lost two domes. So he wanted to build more domes, but he wanted them fireproof and designed properly. If you look at the left dome and the, the little uh, extension coming out and look at the window, now look at the top part of the window. It's not a straight horizontal flat overhang on that window with a soffit. It's beveled at an angle so that when you, if you had a fire, the embers wouldn't go into that right angle space and be trapped or start a fire. There's also no ventilation in this dome. This is a hot roof. Um, the material that you're looking at is a half inch cement board. So this is critical. This is the material that we use over our wood frame structure on top of the three quarter inch plywood. So all of this is put on, uh, you seal all these seams with more cement, and then you spray coat with either supercrete or permacrete. And these are materials, this is a coating that you put over it that's uh, not it's a non-combustible coating and you're dealing with colors that you can choose from and you spray it on. So this is your fireproof structure. You'll notice the dome 
uh, patio doors, both of those patio doors have a slightly sloped soffit. Again, to have air flow around this thing, fire embers don't get trapped anywhere. But it also relates to the first 50 feet of vegetation and the second 50 feet of vegetation, and then the next 100 feet of vegetation. So it is a criteria that you're finding in any fire prone area when they come back to build. California's got new fire codes, and these I'm sure are being used all across the Western states. Here's the inside of uh, the main part, the main dome in the middle, and there's a bedroom on the left and a bedroom on the right. Uh, there's a kitchen in between two domes. Um, this was designed for somebody whose, whose daughter uh, came to live with him in one of the domes. So the connecting link is sort of communal space. Then that goes into private bedroom spaces in two of the domes. So if you're really going to build in those areas, that's what we can provide you is the system that's going to work and give you an ignition proof house. So. Um, I guess with that question, there's also kind of a partner question here from uh, Cynthia Thank Lee. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate that information. I'm just getting started and uh, sure. it's, 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 that's helpful. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome, Michael. Uh, I'm gonna say, say Cynthia Lee said, I've been doing research on historical housing for very hot climates wondering how one would incorporate a number of those passive design elements, um, Venturelli effect into domes, and if NSD has begun working on these issues as climate change hastens. The um, dome that we've got here, she's talking about this Venturi effect of the inside of the dome, this natural airflow. Real simple. These are those lower windows that we have all along this whole entire area in the living room and also in the bedroom. We've got screen doors in. We've got a cupola up at the top with windows. Those could also be Velux skylights that open up electrically. Uh, we have windows in the cupola, where there's no floor. We have a, a switch over here on the wall, push button. So I can push that button and open the windows. So this is going to be this cleansing of the interior air that you breathe. We can open the windows in the cupola. We can open these windows. And then that hot air that's building up during the daytime, which we don't have hot air building up. I'm sorry, this inside temperatures that we have in the 70s with these mini splits is not from the daytime. Now, it's a different story when you've got outside air that's not going to drop below a comfortable level, maybe like Phoenix is, where the lowest temperature is, what, 95 degrees or 100 degrees at night? So then your mini splits, what's going to work? And the extra insulation level that we're doing, uh, there's different ways we do insulation, is going to keep your house cool. Window orientation is a big part of it. The radiant, we have radiant floor heating. Um, the cement is gonna keep this cooler and that's what's helping right now. Their sun is not coming in in the south. It's coming in in the east. When it gets to the south, it's back of me. We don't have any windows. So this floor is staying cool. Now it is insulated below the slab. And that's all part of that this is designed for radiant floor heating, there's really nothing out there that I've seen that's radiant cooling. The slab itself is going to keep this cool. It's a large mass. It's four inches thick. It's insulated below it. You want, ins if you're doing it for heating, you want insulation below it. If you're not doing it for heating in the south, then make sure you've got a vapor barrier underneath that slab to stop any moisture from migrating up through it. But then that slab will maintain the temperature of the soil below it. And the last thing I'll say is we have a three foot deep probe and a seven foot deep probe because in the middle of this structure right here, there's a 16 foot square 
five different kinds of insulation with 10 temperature probes. And we've shown that you need at least four inches, if not six to eight inches of foam underneath the slab from a heating standpoint. The probes down at seven feet move between winter to summer here in this climate zone about a half a degree to three quarters of a degree at that seven foot depth. At the three foot depth, it's moving uh, one and a half to two degrees. So there is some movement down at that. And that's not near the outside, it's near the inside. So the data we've got, the data we've collected, you saw the three temperature probe in the wall upstairs earlier that we started the program with. We're backing up the stuff that we do by building it, by doing it, by researching it. I have people doing conventional houses that call me to say, what is this data you did with the five different kinds of, of insulation? I say, it's there, it's on the site, so. Well, yes, we have a pesky little black bear. He's not so little, Tessa said, okay. Uh, last night he got both bird feeders, the one in the front and the one in the back. So then what you need are bars on the windows, which we don't have. So she's, we don't open the windows at night. Um, this is far into the season when we usually don't see him, but because this weather is so bad, I think he's looking for all the bird feeders along the creek here. There's a creek that all of, there's about four or five neighbors and we all warn each other, oh, the bear's out again, looking for bird seed. Um, so handle it with bars on the, on the sky, on the windows here. Cool, well, Cynthia, thanks for the question. Uh, let's see, next one here. We have Todd and Holly from Stoddard, Wisconsin. Um, they say, we previously owned a dome home in California and they loved it. Um, they're back in the Midwest though and are interested in building a dome here, but don't want to deal with stairs. What are our single floor, single floor living options? We'd want at least two bathroom and two bedroom. Derek? Yeah, that's uh, not a problem at all. Um, domes, anybody that's familiar with, with the terminology of domes, I, I won't get into explaining it if you're not, but basically there are high and low profiles and there's mid profiles. And so sometimes if you're not interested in a, in a second floor, you could do a four frequency low profile, for instance, which also comes in a low profile version. And that basically means the whole dome's a little bit lower. So you do lose that second floor space, but if you're not really interested in the second floor anyway, um, then you don't need it. And it's easy to get two, three bedrooms on that, that main floor. There's extension options where you can, um, like I'm staying here in a small, we call it the guest dome. It's just a 30 foot diameter, low profile dome. And the bedroom's in one of the extensions. So you could technically add a second bedroom even on a small dome like that. Um, however, you know, if you had a 40 foot diameter dome or larger, you could have one to two of the bedrooms just inside on the main floor, not a problem at all. So, so yeah, that's just all part of the design. And that's some of the criteria that kind of drives the type of dome you get, the size of it, the, the frequency of it. Um, it it kind of drives the high profile, low profile, mid profile, just different. Are you more than half of a circle? Are you a half circle, less than half of a circle? And how large is it? How many extensions? But it's absolutely no problem. Um, like in Bear Creek, where Dennis is currently, uh, they do have a really nice upper floor with two bedrooms and a, and a bathroom and an office. But it's really just kind of for guest purposes. They do all their living on the main floor. so And they just have the one extension. Um, with the staircase in it. So yeah, it, no problem at all to do two bedrooms, two baths on a main floor. Um, yeah, that might be a good one for you to jump in a little bit, Dennis, since you do all the design work. Do you have a kind of a, a favorite type of recommendation on what you would start with in that situation? I think muted, I muted, currently. Dennis. I got it. So, um... The reality is, is how big do you want your rooms? How much space do you want? Uh, you can certainly have a main floor bedroom and a second bedroom that's smaller as a guest bedroom. So it's a matter of designing that for your space need. We do have plans that have a 36 foot diameter dome. 
which is basically 950 square feet. There are two bedrooms on the main on the main floor, and uh, another bedroom up in the loft. It's a 36 foot what we call low profile dome. Kitchen, bath. I mean, kitchen, dining room, living room. Uh, there's a bath in between the two bedrooms. There's one even with a bath and a half, all in a 36 foot diameter dome. They're tight, you know, it's small, but if that's what you want, that can be done. Okay, so cool. thanks. Um, so the next one is from uh, Heidi Horath. Um, it also kind of goes along with Barbara's question from Longmont, Colorado about um, rehab, or sorry, roofing materials for re-roofing a dome. Um, let's see, Heidi says, we believe in domes. We built one many years ago and we need to re-roof it and no one can help us, not a conventional roofer. Uh, we hoped 30 years ago that solar shingles would be in existence, but not yet. We have invested in, in your mission, but we'd like to know of a way, uh, can we apply your roofing materials to our existing dome? And um, yeah, with that, Barbara was asking about, you know, roofing materials and local contractors and how that sort of works. Yeah, um, well, real quickly, I'll just say that we work with uh, Dan Newcomb. He's he's a general contractor who specializes in, in re-roofing domes. And the way Dan phrases it is any decent roofing company can do a dome. There's nothing special or difficult about a dome. We do offer a roofing manual online um, so that if somebody is roofing a dome for the first time, they can, and they're an experienced roofer, they can probably glance through it in five or 10 minutes and see kind of the unique parts of the dome, how we do it, how we recommend to do it. Um, but, but any conventional house roofer should have no problem roofing a dome. It is more time consuming, so it will be a little bit more per square or 100 square feet is usually how they price it. Um, but it's not a difficult thing to do. Um, however, having said that, you know, depending on where you are and what the demand is, uh, builders have been so busy the last couple of years that anything that is unique or might slow them down, they've been avoiding because they just are stamping out work like crazy. Um, so that might be part of the problem. Um, as far as the solar shingles go, there are now a couple of companies that have some pretty decent solar shingles. Um, and I wish I could say they are the perfect solution for a dome, but with a dome, because of the shape of it, it's hard to get a real nice, big, dedicated amount of square footage facing true south at the right kind of angle that you want. I mean, you would have a panel that's almost always facing the sun throughout the day, so you would get optimum sun quality on different parts of the dome throughout the day. Um, but I always kind of think that really a standalone ground-based system or a garage that's next to the dome that could be orientated south, you know, if there's new construction would be more of an advantage than going with the solar shingles on the dome. If you just wanted a small patch, you're like, well, this part of the dome lines up perfectly with the south and it's the right angle of incidence to the sun and everything. It's like, this would give me the maximum energy output. Um, you could definitely integrate these shingles and small patches on those parts of the dome and they do work um, because you can kind of use regular shingles on the corners that have to bend over or be cut and then solar shingles in the middle but it's just not a very easy clean detail on domes for that um, but yeah it's unfortunate to hear that you're having a hard time getting a roofer because it should not be a hard time to do um, i've actually been on job sites or like hell damage for an insurance claim where they did all the skylights and they did a whole new roof and we showed up to do some of the skylight work and the roofing company showed up in the morning and at the end of the day the entire dome and a three-car garage and two out buildings were completely redone so it's not like it's this huge time-consuming job for these guys they, they can still do a dome even in a day um it's just you know they could probably do two maybe even three conventional houses uh, per manpower than as, as a single dome. So a lot of times I think they're like, well, we can charge a lot more or we can just do a couple, I'll stamp out some easy jobs. So, so you might just be struggling with the supply and demand ratio right now where you're at. Um, but yeah, you, you shouldn't need like a person that specializes in domes to do the roofing. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's a very common question. Um, yeah. These, these days. 
one of the things that we have is a uh, chapter in our construction manual on roofing. And that's available to any roofer. Um, we charge, if it's one of our domes, we'll have you have it in a construction manual right away. But if it isn't, if it's somebody else's dome or an older dome, and you got a roofer that needs to know, it's a chapter and it's available for $30. Purchase that, uh, anybody can buy that. Uh, digital copy or paper copy, whatever you want to do. Pardon? Yep. And we're working on a video. <laughs> part, of, part of the video is in the, um, the digital uh, dome school, the virtual dome school. So you can see Dan, I call him Dan the roofer, um, that went, he's our teacher of the shingling in the dome school. So he's recorded on there. Uh, we are um, this fall sometime. It's in the it's in the plan to enhance a lot of stuff with video that we have. We have a lot of video. We just have to get it edited and out there, and uh, it's going to help a lot of people with details. And that's the big thing is the details. Yeah. You know, Dennis, I realized I, I missed the second part of that roofing material to rehab two structures. Um, honestly, the most common roofing material is your standard asphalt shingles. Like we recommend malarkey shingles because they work great bending the corners, they're real flexible, wide nailing flange. Uh, Dan Newcomb, the guy we've been talking about, endorses them and loves them. So we endorse them as well. But really, just your standard roofing materials are the same on a dome as it is on any conventional house. So I won't go any deeper into that, but I just, I forgot that little part. So, um, yep, just the regular stuff. <laughs> so, oh, thank you for the question. Uh, let's see, we'll go on to the next one. We have uh, Tajwana and Keith from Hartwell, Georgia. Um, they ask, uh, say, where dome builder is concerned, there are only two types of skylights, ones that leak and ones that are gonna leak. Any solutions? Well, I could be very sarcastic about this one, but my wife wouldn't like that. Um, there's two types of roofers, ones that can roof the skylight correctly and ones that can really not go around a skylight correctly. It's all in the details. We have, um, they call this the Bear Creek Dome. We have the office dome. We have my old dome built in 1975 and it was remodeled extensively in 1983. That's 40 years ago. I hate to say that, that's long ago. There's a guest dome that was designed for my late sister-in-law. We have two shop domes. We have a, a total of 47 triangle and trapezoid skylights. The Original dome um, that was remodeled in 83, there are 19 skylights on that dome. They don't leak. People show up here randomly. We don't have all these scheduled times. So you people stop by, they call. If you want to talk to us, so we'd like to do the call first and so you're able to talk to us. But if you want to tour our domes, you can tour our domes. If it's raining out, it's raining out. We have a tour in the spring, in the middle of May, and a tour in the first Saturday. If it's raining out, great. Because all of the domes on our tour, which we have built, don't leak. All 47 skylights that we have around here now don't leak. So... The roofer who doesn't know how to roof around a skylight is the main problem that we have. He doesn't understand it. They don't follow our directions. We provide all the materials and then they come back and say, oh, that's not how I normally do it. And they do it their own way. And we can tell you it will leak. If they want to shingle your roof and say, well, these are all ridge caps these are these ridges on these all these lines of the dome need ridge caps on them don't sign anything with that person he doesn't know what he's doing the dome will leak 
We've been called in as expert witnesses after an insurance company had their roofer do the dome with rich cap shingles. All of the roof was taken off at the expense of the insurance company. And the proper way to roof that was done by somebody other than that roofer. So I just have a problem when people say that it's going to leak because it has a skylight. We sell Velux skylights. Their system actually is now caught up with our system that we've had for the last 40 years. Realize the shingles in that original dome that are 40 years old are materials that were done at the time. We still use mainly Tremco sealants, tape sealants, uh, caulking and sealants. I shouldn't say caulking, it's sealants uh, on our skylights. They don't leak, but they will if you don't follow the directions. Any skylight will leak. No. No. Um, yeah. Not much else to say there, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, the next question um, from uh, George in Quaker Hill, Connecticut. Um, are open trusses suitable for floor joists above a basement in a dome? Or are they too tall to accommodate the connections to the riser walls? Derek? Uh, no, they're not too tall. Um, basically, I, I think a lot of people think maybe domes have special um, circumstances when it comes to construction. But I guess the easiest way to say it is if you're a plumber, uh, electrician, um, it's all the same as any conventional house, and that includes the floor system as well. So you can put a dome on, on any kind of floor joist you want. Uh, if you're talking about as far as connecting it down to the foundation, like we were talking about earlier, where we are talking about some hold down hardware, um, they make hardware that allows you to connect through those type of floor systems into whatever you want. So, so yeah, if you wanted to have like an open web design, high floor truss on, on for your main floor so you can run ductwork through there, you want to be able to run stuff through there, um, you can absolutely do it just like you would on any conventional house. There's zero restrictions with that. Just making it a dome doesn't change how any of those kind of details are made. So. Um, I think that's another kind of thing people think or like, oh, what? A, how will my plumber plumb through a dome? It's the same as any conventional house. Um, if they're running a vent pipe up on the outside of the dome, they may have to use some 22s and 45s and 30 and 60 degree angles as they go, but it's no problem, no problem for those guys. Um, so, so yeah, that one is a quick one, I guess. So we'll take advantage of it since we still got a couple left. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, okay. Um... Let's see, we have a next one is uh, let's see, Bruce Consiglio from New Paltz, New York. Uh, is it possible to put a door in a side wall, parentheses, uh, four foot of a extension if it is braced with a welded frame surrounding the door, knowing that it is a critical stress point? Dennis? Yeah, um, what we're dealing with here is this is an extension that we have in our dome right here. This is about, um, on the outside, it's about a four foot extension. So it comes out from the dome and goes out this way. This is about two and a half, three feet. The wall's one foot thick. What he's saying is if this went out four feet, can he put a door in the side wall, realize that 18 inches of this is our dome structure. But if that extension's going out, can he put a door in the side of that extension? What we require in our dome is, where the top of the riser wall is, which is about the, where the cabinet is, that's the height of the riser wall it means that for, in this case, 42 inches out, we don't want to see anything in that wall because that's bracing this corner. Now there's one exception. If you want to be stuck with just four foot and you want a door in that side wall, Again, I'll refer you back to Simpson's catalog. They make what is called a moment frame. So you've got a square frame actually that goes around the door, steel, really um, expensive. We've done it. We've done it down in North Carolina where there was a patio door like this. It needed a steel frame around it so that it didn't move one way or the other. So that's what you're gonna need 
because you don't have enough wall structure to support this riser wall corner and the rest of it. So you put in this big steel frame, which then has to get bolted down to a very solid concrete base. So yes, it can be done. Um, it's complicated, more expensive. Why can't you have a six foot extension and for the first three feet, don't do anything and then put your door out there. We also have what we call straight one side extensions. In this case, this comes up and follows a strut line as it does on the other side. So it's like this shape, this trapezoidal shape. But if once you get beyond the strut, you can do a straight vertical wall going up. And in our office, uh, which is a 36 foot diameter dome, we actually have five, four, <laughs> actually five, five extensions coming off of that. Two of them are straight walls on both sides of the extension. And three of them have angled on one side and straight on the other with windows in those side walls. So it's a design. Uh, we work it out with you. If you're stuck with some limitations for our setbacks and things that we work out. So we'll leave it at that, that yes, we can do it. Yes, we can create what you want. It's all a matter of what you want to pay for. All right. Okay. Um, let's see. Moving on to, we have, we have uh, two more questions here and then we'll try to get to uh, what people have been posting in, in uh, chat. So just, just bear with us a little while longer. Um, we have Lorraine Waller in Newmarket, Ontario, Canada. Um, are your structures able to be built into hillsides? Derek? Uh, yes, they are. Um... Again, anywhere you can build a conventional house, you can build a dome. In fact, it's funny because the dome I'm in right now, if I were to walk, oh, maybe 15 feet out from the dome, I'd be at least 15 feet lower on the, on the ground. We're basically on a hillside here with a little creek on it. So is the dome behind me and the third dome, not as, as aggressive on a hill, but still it slopes down Bear Creek is on a kind of a level spot, slopes down. Here's a picture Dennis took today showing the hillside there. Um, I think you also got that picture, Aaron, in Sedona as well, where they they uh, flattened out one spot that the dome sits on, and then the dome is elevated on the other part as it comes down the hill. So you can absolutely build on a hillside. Um, I tell people, if you can build a conventional house somewhere, you can build a dome just as easily. It's not anything special just because it is a dome. So, um, so yeah. Hillsides are pretty cool. Lots of people at domes really kind of seem to build them in really neat spots. So we've seen them just about everywhere you can imagine. So yeah, no um, problem there. I, I'm curious. Um, I wonder if Lorraine was referring also maybe to berming and having like sort of like a soil sort of covering part of the dome or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. So um, yeah, built into the hillside. I see. Yeah. Um, sure. I'll. Uh, you'll take that, Dennis. I'll take that because I'll make it quick. If you want to burn that this dome into a hillside, you need a variety of things, and we tried the design for this. I got designs I can show people, but um, this was done in the late seventies, early eighties. What? The problem is, is you've got a waterproofing and a structural issue. And if you only do one side of a structure and not the other, this, this thing could move from that. Uh, it's a long story, but berming the dome, you're after something. Are you trying to do uh, something that's gonna keep it cooler or warmer? Because if you are, Go to 18 inch thick walls, go to 21 inch thick walls. It'll be much cheaper, as we learned over these years, than trying to berm the dome and keep that soil there and waterproof the whole structure. So it's a problem. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, so we don't recommend doing that, but maybe. We don't recommend you could. doing the berm. Yeah. No. 
No. Uh, okay, so I think the uh, last question here, uh, David Roderick um, in uh, Chehalis, Washington asks, how difficult is it to expand the width of an extension beyond, well, sorry, once it's beyond the set opening of the dome? Uh, the easiest and most effective way, and also the easiest, most effective way to light the kitchen slash great room area from above. Does it take an experienced lighting designer? And how best to shade the great room of wall of windows from direct afternoon sun? Is David online with us? He was earlier. I saw him on there. Yeah, it looks like he's still here. He is. Hey, David. Yep. Over here in red. <laughs> so my first question, David, is we've got plans that we've already drawn. Are you looking to enlarge one of your extensions? <laughs> it's, it's a question that, yes, it can be done. You need to come out about four feet from the dome to support the corners of the dome when you create an opening. And when you do that, when you get outside of that about a four foot line, you've braced those corners properly, and now you could expand one side or the other side or both sides and create, because there, there's a non-structural issue in doing that. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not a problem, it can be done. Probably won't be done because I think it's easier to move the temporary power pole the two, three feet in uh, with a new oh, line. So that's what you're dealing with. Yeah, it'd be... Yeah. Better to move the power pole and, and the panel box than, than to try to work around it. We've done it. I've done it with trees over at the other dome. We've zigzagged the um, kitchen plan around these 50 to 70 foot high pine trees that we have. Uh -huh. Lighting wise, what I did is I turned this around to show you the lighting we have over this table. Uh, Tessa, if you want to do the dimmer switch on that, show them what we're dealing with. Um, so you can dim this down. These are LED lights, so they all don't dim down the same. But you're dealing with the proper lighting that you need for here. You don't need a lighting engineer to tell you this. What you need is where do you sit? Where do you work? Um, here we've got a microwave, which has lights underneath it. There's lighting up here. There's, there's lighting up here that's LED lighting that shines down over the kitchen sink area to light that. That also can be on a dimmer switch so you can adjust it. What you're not seeing is the lighting that we have over the dining room. Um, I've seen that twice, Dennis. I've been in that room with your boards you have coming out from your oh, own yeah. property this trees. Is, this is yeah. how we're supporting the lighting over the kitchen. I didn't want to see a column coming down here. So mm -hmm. we use these cuttings that we have from an oak tree that fell on our own property. So we support these lights. But the lighting that we have right above me, that's what's shining on my head, is from a five, is it six or five? Six, a six light chandelier that has up lighting. So the shield on it, as opposed to these shields, is turned the other way. So it does provide lighting down. Downward. It's lighting down. But the main part of that, and we have 100 watt LED bulbs here, so there's 600 watts of power, light up the dome itself. Mm -hmm. Really have, from that standpoint, I can, I can do this, because this is what we're talking about. See if it'll show it. Yeah, there's see, there's my yeah, yeah. So the indirect lighting coming down off the dome. Indirect lighting bouncing up on the dome. Mm -hmm. We've also done it with valence strips that go around this second horizontal line, which is right along here, and put valence strips coming along and have up lighting and down lighting. Um, you don't need a lot. You can have spotlights, you can have floodlights up here to try to brighten that up. All of that is just part of uh, how you're going to live in the dome and how much lighting you want and the kind of lighting you want. So we won't go into the details of all that because you got the 2700K lights, you got 5000K daylight bulbs, which is what you're seeing here. 
these are um, LED lights. So they're, I mean, they're, yeah, those are LED lights, but those are the 3000 K or the 25 K. So they're oranger, yellower. These are pure white bulbs. So a lot of that can be adjusted. And you also have to find the light fixture. You have to find the fixtures that you want that are gonna work for your decor that you have. But you do wanna have this up lighting available to you. Mm -hmm. okay. You also Thank have you. an option on interior walls, interior rooms, like a bathroom or something that you can do the Velux sun tunnel. And we have one upstairs. Yeah. So that's another way for lighting. The room in yep. back will be upstairs, uh, right in this room up here, which is Tesla's one of Tesla's offices. That's also available. And that can yeah. be down 10, 12 feet down. So you can light up a room on the main floor from the, from the upper floor. A lot of choices, and it's all in part of the design that you want, the design that you're going to do. Thank you. Um, well, one of his one of his questions was about uh, shades. I guess like you know, shades or blinds or something. Is anything you recommend that way as far as like the uh, you know large walls of skylights and such? Um, what the first thing we want to do when you're dealing with the sun coming in, uh, our windows have a low E coating on the window on the skylight class. We can tailor that coating through the glass company that we order from, which is Old Castle Glass, very large glass company. You're looking to cut some sun out. You want to do, uh, the trade name is Solar Band. Solar Band 60 on solar gray or solar bronze glass. On the inside pane, you want to do a surface three another solar band 70 coating. This is gonna reduce your solar heat gain number, solar heat gain coefficient. That's what they measure, SHGC. And that can be brought down to a really low number, 0 0.19, 0 0.17. Uh, those are really low numbers and yet not cut out all of the light by going to a heavily tinted mirror tint class. So, Options are there. We have a lot of new options because we've uh, got some ideas that we tried and they work very well with the current stock of glass that's available. So we're not waiting 18 weeks. Marvin windows were 18 weeks out for a while. They aren't anymore. There's a two month lay time. Uh, most of the supply lines and glass have dropped down to that four to, in our, in our era of how we use the glass, how we order the glass, it's a four week, three week, four week lead time because we're using the stock components. And we found that the stock components with solar uh, tint were no more cost. It was the same cost. So I know yeah. we list tinting in our catalog, in our, in our uh, online website, as an extra, it's not. We don't charge that because it's available as a stock item from the glass company. Thank you. Cool. Sure. Okay, so um, instead of the question, is uh, it's at 7.30, but we have some uh, questions in chat here. We have time to go through some of them. If anybody wants to stay, we're, we're here. Okay. And Let's see. I, I like this first one from Cynthia. Uh, would it be ridiculous to ever try to plaster a dome roof? Roof on the outside? Yeah. Yes. It would be <laughs> ridiculous. So, so like that, that one dome Dennis was showing earlier, the fireproof dome would probably be a close way to get a similar yeah. you know, look without it being plaster. But um, if you were just kind of looking for that smooth, concrete looking appearance, I guess. Um, that would be one way to get close to that. It's not plaster, but it looks similar, maybe. Plaster is not a roofing material. That's what you want. Uh, you've got problems with any kind of a coating. Uh, American Ingenuity had a lot of problems with, with how they did their roofs. Um, you're dealing with monolithic domes. You've got to use very specialized roofing materials. 
So plaster is not it. Stucco is not a roofing material, but the supercrete and permacrete materials, if you want a smooth finish over cement board, are going to give you that look. Now, do you want a little bit of texture to that? You know what they use? Crushed walnut shells. They grind it up. You buy a 100-pound bag of crushed walnut shells, and you mix it in to the paint, to the roll-on material that you're going to do over that. So. Well, say speaking of cement board here, we have Kai who asked, now he keeps a very humid house because he has a lot of reptiles and amphibians and aquariums. And uh, he wants to know if you can do cement for the inner walls to not have to worry about rot and mold on the interior surfaces. Well, I'll jump in there real quick, Dennis, because a lot yep. of times it's not so much the material as it is the condensation point in your house. So you can use wood even in, you know, in 80% humidity, for instance, as long as it's not condensing humidity. Um, so like, for instance, you've probably been in pools, like indoor swimming pools, well, they'll have different materials on the walls and ceilings. Um, and of course, you're subjected to high amounts of humidity, it just can't be con condensing. So you could do a cement board, but then depending on the material, you might need to brace it. Um, or you could do like what the guy did, I guess, on the fireproof dome where he had three quarter inch plywood on the outside and attached the cement board to the plywood. You could do something similar on the inside, but, but cement board will not necessarily give you better protection. I mean, some of it will have different fungicides and, um, you know, mold retarders into the chemistry of the cement, but, but you could even go with some fun wood like teak, for instance, like a teak wood that would not be bothered at all by the humidity or cedar. Um, as long as it's not condensing, you shouldn't have any problems. Um, and you want a vapor barrier, air barrier behind that. You don't want to let the moisture get into your wall cavity. And you want that 100% proof as far as letting any air into it. That's hard to get. It can be done. But it's got to be there before you put the board on. And uh, right, Derek, uh, teak or mahogany or some uh, other woods that are out there. There's actually a company called uh, Bear Creek Lumber. And that's not our lumber company, but uh, it's called Bear Creek Lumber. They sell, as they term, exotic woods. So you're buying something that's uh, very unusual. They get it from different uh, areas, different countries. And that would provide a wood that uh, probably would not support mold, uh, would take the extra humidity that you've got, but you do have to look at moisture control on the inside when you're going to have that much moisture. Cool. Um, then we have, uh, let's see, Ronald Graham, who's asking, is it difficult to add a lightning protection rod to a dome and does the current diversion cable damage the roof? No, um, we have a dome in uh, actually it's on the highest mountaintop in Maryland, which is only 3,000 feet high, but um, it was 200 feet below the mountaintop. He was an engineer and he had a lightning rod on the top of the dome that came down and connected all of the hub systems that we had. There were five lines that came down they were connected to all the hubs, all the corners of the, the uh, metal connection hardware system that we have. On the outside, those wires also connected to the flashing around the skylights. Those went down to a ground rod, which circled the entire dome. And there are more than one ground rod went down into it. There are the three or four ground, or there might have been five ground rods, I think. They proved that it worked because they were doing it when they were building the dome. There was no insulation, no interior panels. They saw the storm coming from across the valley, which is about a 40 mile view. So they went inside, sat down to have coffee and they heard the lightning strike instantly. And it struck the top of the dome rod. They knew exactly how tall that rod was and they had to vaporize the top quarter inch or three-eighths of an inch of the rod. 
they could almost see the lightning electrical energy going down the cords, going down all these lines that they had set up that were inside their roof when they were done. So it does work. So if you're going to build it on a mountaintop like that and be sort of the highest point, you might want to consider that. The dome in Iowa that got hit by lightning had no lightning arresters, nothing. It started a fire. It basically blew the cupola apart. And when you look at the view of it, this is Iowa, flat farmland Iowa. It was a hill with one or two trees and it sat on top of that hill. We, with the fire, they, we simply again, removed all of the parts that were damaged, shipped down new parts. It was the top fourth of the dome probably, and took that all off, repaired the dome, put the shingles back, and put new shingles on, continued on. So, Yeah. Are, are we there yet? Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's one I saw. Um, actually, okay. I don't mind, Aaron. I'll just, uh, since it's yeah, kind of it. summarize it real quick. But Cynthia was just asking about isolating air zones in particular rooms when you have situations like COVID. Um, so I'll just start off by saying I don't know of all the new filtration options they have come out with since COVID, and I'm sure a lot of them work great. But really, the goal is to create a negative pressure in the room and really what that means is and you can do this to any room um, but basically you want if the door is closed you want it to be pulling air in from under the door not letting the air out which means all air in the room goes through a filtration system before it gets circulated to any other part of the house um i'll just quickly kind of touch on that because that's a really a deep question there's a lot of options in there and she talks about some of the different filtration options that might work um, but with the current HVAC system in place, um, typically that's doable. Um, most rooms will have a return air source and, and your uh, source coming from your air conditioning system heater if you got a ductwork, which it looks like the situation does. If you do not, if you're like Dennis, where it has in-floor heat and mini split, it becomes more difficult. However, Dennis does have an air-to-air -air exchanger, so you can still create a negative pressure within a certain isolated portion of the dome so so what we've got is our plan was redone uh copied in a, in a slightly smaller version this is a 49 foot diameter dome we did a 46 foot diameter dome same basic plan but we put a door going out of the master bedroom now this is part of what you need if you're talking about a covid situation where you've got somebody who is sick and needs to be isolated you want people to come in from the outside. You don't want them going through the house into there or from the house, from that room into the house. We have radiant floor heating. There's your heat source. You, we have zones. That bedroom is a zone. We have the mini split in the master bedroom. There's your cooling. There's your heating. You can open windows. You've got in, inside, outside. You need your interior door to be sealed with gaskets going around. So you add the gaskets going around your door, including a sweep at the bottom. So there's your isolated room as a master bedroom, living quarters, put the refrigerator in there, have a cold beer, whatever. I mean, you can do this. And it is something that we have talked with other clients in saying, what about this? What about that situation? And that's your answer. Get the door from that bedroom going outside. You want nurses, personnel, people coming in, doctors, whatever. That's the way to handle that. So it can be done. Okay. Well, uh, 7.45. Uh... Yeah. It's the longest we've been. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we, had, we had a pretty big one this time. It's pretty I awesome. I, know. I think the uh, New York Times article uh, is pretty good for that. That's right. It was a pretty yeah. exciting article. It was a great article. Uh, it showed domes in the positive manner. And I think that's really, it's being picked up uh, by a lot of other people. There's some conversations going on with Australia 
and Reuters, Reuters in uh, London. Um, New York Times is worldwide. And I think this has helped uh, the image of the dome and the practicality of the dome when we talk about climate change and what we're going to experience in the next decades. Mm -hmm. People are finally getting worried. Yeah. And wanting to do something about it. Well, thank all of you for joining us. I know it was a long one, and a lot of you stayed, or quite a few people stayed on for a long time. But, yeah. um, there just were a lot of questions. So we like to hear these questions, and this is a good way that everyone can hear the answers at the same time. So, and you notice that Derek and I like to talk a lot. Yes. There's <laughs> that problem. Great. Right. So. Right. <laughs> Thank you all. All right. All right. Yeah. We'll see all right. you next all time. Right, Thank okay. you guys. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Oh, and I'll post the video here uh, in the next couple of days as well. So you'll be able to show it to all your friends. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. See you guys. Okay. Thank you. Bye.